Good morning everyone and welcome to the Restore live stream. It's great to have you joining us today. Uh, you can probably tell from behind me and alongside me, we're starting our Christmas uh, messages. Uh, now we're in December, so Christmas starts properly. I can't, I can't believe the, uh, how early people seem to start Christmas these days. I've already had stick from Dustin because I haven't got a Christmas pullover on. But for me, we're still at the beginning of December. I'm still only just slightly getting warmed up to it. And our theme for Christmas this year is uh, Countdown to Christmas. Christmas, and we called it Countdown to Christmas because it's the Advent season and uh, Advent is all about waiting and uh, we're celebrating really or reflecting on the journey of waiting for uh, Jesus to be born on Christmas Day and so there's uh, four Sundays in Advent and uh, traditionally you have uh, what's over here on my left on uh, your right which is uh, an Advent um, I was gonna say an Advent calendar it's not an Advent calendar though some of us have got those at home it's an it's the four candles of Advent I always smile whenever I talk about four candles. If you don't understand that, you need to Google it and go on YouTube and watch the two Ronnies and the four candles uh, uh, sketch. But anyway, uh, over these four weeks, we're going to take uh, one of the Advent calendars, uh, Advent candles, it's because it begins with the same letter. I'm doing really well today, aren't I? Um, we're going to take one of the Advent candles each week because each of them represent different things. And so this week I'm going to be talking about hope, which is a really significant issue I think for all of our lives. Next week uh, Jody's going to be talking about joy. Uh, the week after the 17th I'm going to be speaking this time about peace. I will try and uh, look out the Christmas pullover for that week and on the 24th you're going to get a double portion of Christmas pu um, Christmas pullovers because Dustin's on on the 24th and he'll he's bound to go large with his Christmas uh, pullover and he's talking about love. So we're going to take those as our themes for each of the weeks. Um, we have produced a count down to Christmas um, little booklet that you can uh, get either by, uh, if you email us, info at restorecc.org.uk, we'll get one to you. Um, otherwise, they're being given out at each of our physical uh, congregations. And it's an opportunity to go through the Advent season day by day with a daily reading and an opportunity just to connect with Jesus in this season of waiting. So our theme for today is hope. Um, hope is actually an incredibly powerful force in our life, isn't it? I was looking up a, a definition of hope, and uh, hope is a feeling of expectation and desire for a particular thing to happen. A feeling of expectation and desire for a particular thing to happen. And, uh, and I think for me, it's one of the things that enables me to journey through life when I have a hope that uh, there's something good that is going to happen. There's something that I've been longing for. There's something that I've been expecting. There's something that I've been waiting for that's going to happen. Equally, it can be really hard when you have to wait a long time between receiving the promise of a hope and actually the fulfillment of it. And it can be incredibly painful and traumatic when hopes are destroyed and the thing that you've been longing for, the expectation that you've had, disappoints, it doesn't happen. We miss the fulfillment of it, that's which, what, what the word disappoint means. Um, it's, it's a missed appointment. Um, that can be incredibly painful. You know, you probably know the verse in the Bible that talks about Proverbs 13, verse 12. It says, hope deferred makes the heart sick but a dream fulfilled is a tree of life. And I love the message translation, puts it down in, in everyday language for us, but in the message it says, unrelenting disappointment leaves your heart sick, but a sudden good break can turn life around. And uh, <clears throat> the reason we thought it'd be good to spend a bit of time just unpacking hope is because over the last few years, we've had a very difficult global environment. We've had one thing after another that has made life challenging. And I think part of the impact of that is for many of us, we've had our hopes dashed. That was one of the pains of COVID, wasn't it? The things we've been looking forward to and hoping and anticipating just suddenly stopped. But actually since then, because of the instability that there has been, because of the tough economic climate, it's been hard to recapture some of that sense of, of, of excitement. And for many of us, I think our hearts have taken a beat, beating through it. I think um, our hearts maybe are a little bit sick. Now what's interesting about that 
is uh, at the time of the birth of Jesus, it was a really tough time for the nation of Israel. And uh, I'm going to read a little bit from Luke chapter 1 in a moment. But it, in terms of the context into which Jesus was born, if you think about it for a few minutes, number one, God had been silent for 400 years. So the, the Old Testament ends 400 years before the birth of Jesus. And for Israel, they represented, they interpreted that silence as God's spirit, God's presence, had left them as a nation. So they were feeling bereft by God, called to be God's people, and yet God seemed to be absent. And that was a really tough place to be. Secondly, Israel was under Roman occupation. You know, it's been horrific, hasn't it, over the last few months to see uh, war in the middle of Israel once more um, and to see uh, bloodshed and heartbreak. At the time of Jesus, um, Israel was under Roman occupation. And soldiers would have been patrolling the streets uh, day in, day out. And again, that must have felt like a very hopeless situation. Can you imagine that you're God's people, meant to be a light to the nations, but actually your land has been invaded by a hostile power that is that has taken over uh, you, and you're living in, in fear, and kind of with a sense of, is this ever going to end? Thirdly, Herod, who was the, the ruler of the uh, Israel uh, nation at the time, he'd only got to power by an alliance with the Roman Empire. And uh, part of, uh, part of uh, Herod's history is he wasn't actually a true Jew. And so the person who's meant to be leading you and who represents uh, God and, and your faith actually is a corrupt version of what the leadership is meant to be, which further compounds that sense of darkness and hopelessness. Um, fourthly, your religious leaders are all divided. You know, at the time of Jesus, there were, uh, the religious leaders were divided into four camps. There was the Pharisees, who didn't do a great job. Uh, when uh, Jesus comes along, we find the Sadducees, who also weren't doing a great job. The Essenes, who had retreated from Jerusalem altogether. And the Zealots, who, wanted, uh, who in effect were like terrorists or freedom fighters. Um, and so they were, they were attacking the Roman soldiers and trying to use uh, guerrilla warfare, really, to, to bring a place of freedom. And yet these were the people meant to be leading the spiritual life and the religious life for the nation. It must have been very fearful and, uh, and complex and difficult to make sense of that. Not only that, but if we make it personal, we'll look at the story of, of Mary in a moment, but if we make it personal into Mary's life, Mary would have been a teenager probably at the time that Gabriel um, spoke to her. So she was at a very vulnerable part of life. And also we know in Israelite culture that when a child was named, the name would be significant. It, would, it wasn't just, oh, I like that name, so you know, we'll call her this. Um, the name would carry some weight to it. And the, the root of the name Mary, uh, the Jewish equivalent is Miriam, uh, so the Jewish root for the name. And Miriam actually means bitter. And so we don't know the full experience of, of Mary's background, but it tends to imply that she was born into a bitter situation, into a tough uh, climate. And we also know that she was born in Nazareth, and, uh, and Nazareth had a reputation of being kind of the last place she'd want to be on earth. So if you add all of those things together, it was very bleak and very hopeless. And yet, God broke in. And maybe this morning you're feeling like your situation, your circumstances, your life, what's going on in your family, what's going on at work, your financial situation, maybe it's feeling quite bleak and hopeless. Well, the good news is it's just in situations like that that God specialises in breaking in and bringing fresh hope. And the story of that is in Luke, and I'm going to start in Luke uh, chapter 1, verse 26, and just read from 26 to uh, 45 um, in terms of the encounter that Mary has with Gabriel and what happens on from it and how hope is released once more. In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favoured. The Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, 
Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favour with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you are to call him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. How will this be, Mary asked the angel, since I'm a virgin? The angel answered, the Holy Spirit will come on you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age, and she who is said to be unable to conceive is in her sixth month. For no word from God will ever fail. I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May your word to me be fulfilled. Then the angel left her. Excuse me, I'm going to cough. (coughs) Right, carry on. At that time, Mary got ready and hurried to a town in the hill country of Judea, where she entered Zechariah's home and greeted Elizabeth. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby leapt in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. In a loud voice she exclaimed, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the child you will bear. But why am I so favoured that the mother of my Lord should come to me? As soon as the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the baby in my womb leapt for joy. Blessed is she who has believed that the Lord would fulfil his promises to her. Great passage, probably very familiar with the Christmas story. But just a few things I want to draw out of it in terms of how we welcome and maintain hope when we're living in a tough climate. Because that's really the, the, the story of this. And I think one of the life lessons that we can learn from that, one of our takeaways needs to be, how can I foster and gain and live out Uh, hope even when the world around me seems to be speaking another message and just five quick things I want to say on it I won't spend a long time on them but five quick keys I think that we can get from this passage number one hope needs to come from the right place do you know if we if hope is a expectation or a desire for a particular thing to happen if our desires are misplaced then it's no surprise that we're disappointed Equally, if our hope is vested in the right place, then we can be confident that some of those things will start to come to pass. And the reality is, if God made us and we were made in relationship for him, if we were made to live in union for him in God's world, then the number one place we need to anchor ourselves and put our hope is in God. And right the way through the uh, Christmas story, the people that God chooses to work through are all people who've kept their eyes on him no matter what the circumstances around have said. So Zechariah and Elizabeth, um, mom and dad of John the Baptist, Jesus' cousin, um, it says in in verse 8 of uh, chapter 1, both of them were righteous in the sight of God, observing all the Lord's commands and decrees blamelessly. So in spite of the external circumstance, they'd kept their eyes on God. Mary, her response is, is, I don't understand this, God, paraphrase. Um, But then she says, but God, let it be according to your word. And she was a God-fearing teenager. Joseph, uh, it says in Matthew's account of of the story, that he was a righteous man, which is why he refused to um, to secretly put Mary away, even though she ended up with child... um, before um, they were ever married, which would have been a shame thing. But actually he had the heart, he carried the heart of God, so which was why God used him. When later on we come to Simeon and Anna, who first meet Jesus when he's presented at the temple, we find that Anna had worshipped in the temple day after day, day after day, day after day. And now was an old lady, and we find that Simeon had been waiting for the promised child, but they'd held on and they'd chosen to be rooted in God. And for many of us, we get disappointed because our focus gets shifted onto other things. I don't know how many people have watched uh, Welcome to Wrexham. I'm not necessarily a great uh, football uh, fan, but I really enjoy, I've really been enjoying the story of, of Wrexham um, United. And uh, since it's been bought by Ryan Reynolds and uh, Rob McElhenney, then um, they've put a lot of money into it. And suddenly the football team has started to win and succeed. And it's uh, been really interesting seeing the whole welfare of the town seems to have improved because now the football team is winning. And that's something to celebrate. I just want to do a shout out to Ken. You will appreciate that uh, so much this morning. Great to have you joining us. But 
Um, the, um, the impact that the success of a football team can have on a town is huge. One of the reasons that the impact is so great is because the impact of the catastrophic uh, uh, loss that the team has had over the last 15 years plus, uh, while they've not been a, a, a proper league side, has been incredibly painful into the community. And uh, not that football isn't a great thing, not that we shouldn't have hopes and dreams based around it, but if you build your whole life on it, at some point you're going to be disappointed because no winning season goes on forever. But the truth is, God's hope doesn't disappoint. In Romans chapter 5 verse 5, Paul writes that, he says, he says that God's hope will not disappoint us. And so we've got to say, that as nice as the other hopes are, as, as nice as the other things are, maybe it's better if they're wishes rather than hopes. But actually, if we're going to centre our hope anywhere, we need to centre it on God and remind ourselves in the tough, se- tough seasons. So number one, make sure your hope is rooted in the right place. Number two, look for where God is at work and celebrate that. Look for where God is at work and celebrate that. The truth is God had seemed to be silent for 400 years, but God had still been on work, at work. He still had been providing for people day by day. He still had been alongside people in their hardship. And in verse 28, it says an angel, which is a messenger from God, an angel went to Mary and said, and God initiated the process of something new breaking out. If we want to find, if we want to be a people of hope, if we want to re-find help, hope, then go to the place where God is at work. And in this story, God is at work in Mary, and the angel comes to Mary. Actually, if you get around people who are experiencing God at work, you will soon find your hope and your faith and your expectancy for God to work will increase. I've used this story a number of times, but when I first came to London, the church that I went to was a great church, really loving family. But after about six months, I just felt I was a bit stuck in my faith. I felt like I wasn't growing in the way I had been when I'd been at university. And I spoke to one of my friends from university, and I I said that when they asked how I was doing. And they said something really wise to me. They said, well, who in the life of the church do you see is growing in their relationship with God? And when they said that, I instantly thought of a young couple. And they were like, go and make friends with them then. And I did. I made friends with them. I used to drop around and see them. And uh, they uh, got me listening to the stuff they were listening to. They got me reading the stuff that they were reading. And you know what? Within a, a matter of a few weeks, I was starting to grow again, simply because I was hanging around people in whose life God was at work. That's one of the reasons we're called to be a community as a a church, because we share life with one another. So this morning, if you've gone through a hard season, if you're struggling to maintain hope, look around for people who are carrying hope. Look around for people who are experiencing God at work in their lives. Make friends with them, and you'll find you will come to life as you hang around the life and the hope that they are carrying. So number one, make sure hope's in the right place. Number two, look for where God is at work and lean into that. Number three, remember the truth of what God has spoken. Remember the truth of what God has spoken. Can't say this over enough, or can't emphasize this over enough. We are so led in contemporary culture by our feelings. Now, I think feelings are good, and I think for Speaking as a man, um, I think it's healthy for men to be in touch with their feelings, to be able to express them, to have a culture that empowers and enables that. I think one of the reasons that suicide is so bad in young guys is because we haven't built a society that is uh, free for guys to express how they're feeling inside. And I think for us to be in touch with our feelings is really, really good. But at the end of the day, I am not ruled by my feelings. I am ruled by the the truth that I believe in. And ultimately, feelings can follow facts, and they will follow facts. And in this story, what I find really interesting is when the angel comes and and speaks to Mary, and I outlined at the very beginning all the bleak things that were going on, all the tough things, all the dark things, and the first thing the angel says is, is, hi, you're highly favoured. 
And everything in Mary's circumstance was saying, you're not highly favoured. But you know what? The angel said, greetings, you who are highly favoured. And a couple of verses later, he says it again. And he says, you're highly favoured. And he speaks it twice. Why? Because Mary needs to take hold of something. And there's a power in the word of God. And there's a power in the truth of the word of God that actually does our heart good and enables us to start to live in hope. And the reality is there's loads of promises in the Bible for our life. There's loads of promises about the fact I'm going to live with Jesus forever in eternity when I come to the end of my days so I need not to fear death. There's loads of promises in the Bible that God will never leave us even at our toughest moments. There's lots of promises, personal promises that God has given me through prophetic words and pictures and when I remind myself of those things hope starts to rise and you see often we lose hope because we listen to other voices and what the enemy would love to do is the enemy would love to discourage you from believing in the truth of what God wants to do in your lives. And so what we need to do is try and shut down the lies of the enemy and uh, remind ourselves of the truth of God's word. I'm a great fan of... um, uh, Craig Rochelle, who leads Life Church in the States, I'm not necessarily a great fan of everything they do as a church or everything that he uh, uh, teaches, but he does. He, he has on his uh, website, he's got some life declarations, which are just promises from the Bible, statements from the Bible, and he would say the single greatest thing that's helped him to grow over the last few years has been every morning when he gets up, he just declares some promises over his life, and it changes his day, it changes. You see, our feelings go up and down, so if we follow our feelings our days can go up and down but actually truth is consistent and so if we root ourselves in the truth of what God says if we remind ourselves of the promises of God if we hold them in our heart then we can be sure that our day will go a lot better because we're we're then training our feelings to follow the truth of what God has spoken next one we need to welcome the work of the Holy Spirit we need to welcome the work of the Holy Spirit. Mary says to the angel, how, how can this happen? How is this going to happen? That's supernatural. I'm just a virgin. How can I possibly have a, a child? And the angel answers, the Holy Spirit will come on you. The power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. What he basically says to us, if you want to bring something to birth, welcome the work of the Spirit in your life. And the word that's used for the Holy Spirit will overshadow you. It's only used once more in the New Testament. And it's in the story of Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration. When Jesus is transfigured, so he shines in, uh, in, in the fullness of the glory that is in his life. And a cloud comes and overshadows the uh, disciples that are there with him. And they experience what it is to be filled with the Spirit of God. And if we want hope to be reborn, we need to put ourselves in a place where God's Spirit is at work in our lives. And for me, I would say the simplest way to do that is find the context or the environment that easiest helps you to reconnect with God. For some people, that is uh, nature. It's a seaside. I get the privilege sometimes of going to Tenerife and uh, working in partnership with Tenerife Family Church there. They're good friends of ours. One of the things I always do when I'm there is I walk to the coast and I look out to sea and I see in the, in the sunshine the beautiful scenery and the majesty of the sea and I just feel close to God. That feeling close to God is me reconnecting with the Spirit of God. And do you know what? When I do that, I feel God's peace, I feel God's presence and out of that, hope starts to be born. Another thing that works for me is music. I've always loved music, but if I turn up some worship music, it's easy for me to sense the presence of God. If I read particular uh, passages of scripture, I love reading the story of the, the prodigal son and just the welcome he gets back from his dad. And I can sit in that for ages and ages and I just connect with God's love and God's spirit. So... I would encourage you, if you uh, are struggling with hope or you want to see uh, hope reborn in your life, get in a place of uh, of being connected to the Spirit of God. So we've had uh, hope comes from looking in the right place. Look for where God's at work and lean into that. Uh, Look and remind yourself of what God has promised. Welcome the work of the Holy Spirit. And fifthly, put yourself with family. Put yourself with family. I find it fascinating. The very next thing that Mary does is she goes and finds Elizabeth, 
who's pregnant with John the Baptist, and she spends the next few months with her. And, and together, they nurture what God is doing. I actually love it um, in verse uh, 41. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby, John the Baptist, leapt in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. Love the fact that John the Baptist in Elizabeth's womb was meeting Jesus in Mary's womb, and as soon as Jesus came into the room, John the Baptist knew it, and he leapt in his mom's womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. Isn't that great? It's a great illustration of what happens when Jesus walks into the room. Something in us leaps with joy because we sense, ah, here's God. Ah, here's my saviour. Ah, he's the one that I need. But you know, over their next period of pregnancy, of bringing to birth what God was doing, they do it together and they find a place of safety together. One of the things that I have noticed in all my years of doing pastoring, uh, which is a long time now, I've noticed how often when people are in hardship, they retreat and separate themselves from family. And then on top of the hardship, they isolate themselves. And I understand it because that's what you feel like, don't you? Oh, I'm feeling low today. I don't feel like going to church. I'm feeling low today. I don't feel like talking to anyone. But you know, when we're feeling low is exactly the time we need other people. When we're feeling low is exactly the time we need to put ourselves in family. I'm so grateful that we do online church because it's one of the ways when we can't physically get to be together, we can still be together and have a sense that we're part of a family and part of a community. But you know, we need to prioritise and not let the enemy cut us off from relationship and family because family together is what helps preserve and grow hope. So, over this season, when life is hard, let's be people who carry a living hope. Uh, uh, in 1 Peter chapter 1, Peter talks about the fact that, uh, that we've been born again to a living hope in Jesus. And as we look towards uh, Christmas Day, when we celebrate again the birth of Jesus, let's all the way through every day, every week, let's be welcoming God's hope, hope fulfilled, promises fulfilled, God's love being demonstrated in our lives, being experienced in our lives by the love of Jesus. So let's be a hope-filled, hopeful, Jesus-centered people. I'm going to pray, and then uh, we'll bring our time together to an end. Lord, thank you that you are the God of all hope. And Lord, in these moments, Lord, maybe it's good if we just take a moment and just reflect actually what is going on in my heart. Has this last season been tough? Have I experienced hope draining away? In any way has my heart become sick? And Lord, I just want to represent my heart to you. And Lord, I thank you that at a point that that Israel was in such a bleak situation, you intervened and you released hope, you brought hope. And Lord, I pray uh, into uh, the heart of every person watching this, and I pray right now that you will breathe new hope into us. And Lord, as as Father, uh, I've been talking about, Lord, putting your hope in the right place, looking for where God is at work and leaning into it, looking at the truth of your word and your promises, welcoming the work of your spirit and putting ourselves in godly family. Father, will you help us to be people who follow those principles so that we can carry hope and not just carry hope, but because we're alive in hope, actually in our everyday life, in our days and weeks, in our different contexts, we may be hope carriers and hope bringers that actually unlocks and relights hope in the lives of others. May this be a hope-filled season for us all. In Jesus' name, amen.